I want to play a game with you. And I think as we play this game, we'll unpack uh, kind of a lot of the uh, techniques that you use to do this and and really become the best in the world at it. Uh, Let's start with Melinda Gates. So my understanding of the situation is uh, Melinda Gates had done press before, but never kind of exclusively by herself in a profile format, right? No one had ever written right. the Melinda Gates approved profile of her. Uh, right. You were able to successfully do that. How do you meet her? How do you convince her to do it? And then what was the process like actually writing that kind of first exclusive profile of her? I, oh gosh, I spent a couple of years talking to and writing letters to, um, the Gates Foundation and her people. And she had done quite a lot of press with Bill as they were building the Gates Foundation, but she had never, she had never agreed to do an interview for a profile about her. So I wanted to do the first major profile. And I don't know, finally I got in, it was the, I remember I went to Seattle the Monday after, or the Tuesday, I guess it was, after Labor Day in 2007. And I remember the the new head of PR for the Gates Foundation was a woman named Heidi Sinclair. She's one of my closest friends today. I stayed friends with her. And um, she was uh, like her first week on the job. And Melinda was so nervous. And I ended up interviewing Melinda like three times for that story, once in New York. And I interviewed Bill in Seattle separately for that. And I interviewed, you know, a bunch of that. And I, Melinda was great, though. Like she, um, she let me talk to her best friend. You know, I went over to her best friend's house on the lake and, you know, to her house and like had coffee and we're sitting in the kitchen and I'm talking about Melinda. And like Melinda had never told her story. Melinda had never talked about how when she was young, right out of Duke and Duke University and working at Microsoft, you know, kind of low level. And she was walking across the parking lot someday and she saw the CEO, the founder, Bill Gates. And she said hello to him and he asked her out. And, and, and anyway, they fell in like, like she, she really dished and, oh my God, it was fantastic. They lined up Bono for me. And I remember I talked to Bono and so it was great. I mean, they really went all out. And then the story came out right at Christmas time and I got the nicest email over Christmas from Melinda um, telling me she was with her parents and her parents actually loved it, loved the story. And that was a cover story. And that was, you know, like the ultimate, like quintessential, like brand stamp of approval. And then my mother died three weeks later and my mother, loved 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 that story that was like the the her favorite story of all that i had done and that was i had been at fortune for 24 years at that point so um no wait no uh 84 yeah 2000 i had been at fortune for 24 years at that point so in a quarter of a century that was the favorite story that she so it it holds a lot of meaning to me for various reasons yeah. And, and what was like the biggest surprise to that whole process, right? Once she agrees, you go and you talk to everyone, you talk to Bill, um, you kind of hear all the stories. Was there one thing that kind of stood out to you that um, was either a surprise or, or you didn't really uh, understand until you had done all the work? So I forgot too. I actually went, I already knew Warren Buffett well at that point but I had never been out to Omaha. So I went out to Omaha for that story. I mean, I could have interviewed Warren on the phone, but I, you know, I said, I think I said to him, I said, this would be a good chance for me to finally come out and, you know, see you in your office. So I went out and they had announced the giving pledge together where Warren, Warren, who did not expect to give any of his money away until He died and he thought his wife, Susie, would die. Uh, He thought he would, he, 
he never imagined that he would outlive his wife, Susie. So here he is. He lost his wife. He has all this money, doesn't know what to do with it, doesn't know how to be a philanthropist. He says it's harder than making money. So he announces this was before this couple few years before the story came out. He announces that he's giving all his money to the Gateses to distribute because they're experts. So anyway, that's why, and obviously, as most people know, Bill and Melinda and Warren are, are really close. So I went out to Omaha, and here's the answer to your question. Warren tells me how, in, to an extraordinary degree, Melinda kind of, first of all, convinced Bill to give his money away during his lifetime. And, you know, I can't remember the details, but convinced Warren also of the value of that because there are all these diseases around the world and children are dying, people are dying every day. And, you know, let's not save it. Let's put it to, to good use. And Warren just, I mean, there's that, that sort of aha moment. Wow, that's what we should do with our money. But Warren loves Melinda because Melinda has done for Bill what Susie did for Warren, which is basically <laughs> take a nerdy guy who is like all business and all numbers and finds the kind of humanity in him and so it's one of the reasons that warren and bill are so close and it's one of the reasons that warren and, and melinda are so close because he sees a lot of susie and melinda i love that story yeah uh, you and martha stewart while she's in jail oh tell us God. that story that is oh e God. absolutely epic Oh, geez. I had met Martha in 1998 when I did a story called, it was a cover story for Fortune called Women, Sex, and Power. And it was an idea that I had to do a story about. I literally walked into the office of the top editor at Fortune at the time, John Huey, and said, I think we should do a story about women who are doing better than men. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, well, women who are like am doing amazing things that no man has ever done or no man. So anyway, long story short, through that story, I met Martha. I actually had a sort of an evening with her and, and two of her friends, um, Charlotte Beers, who was the head of Ogilvy and made her the big ad agency at the time, and a woman named Darla Moore, who <laughs> I ended up doing a cover story about the following year. Do you know who Dar Darla Moore is, I do not. Anthony? She would be of interest to a lot of your a lot of your listeners because she was the she she was the wife of the late Richard Rainwater. Do you know who Richard mm -hmm. Rainwater? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Big self-made billionaire. But anyway, so I met I met Martha in 1998, one night at the apartment of Charlotte Beers with Darla Moore in New York. Um, we started. Two years later, we Fortune started Fortune Most Powerful Women, which was a, which started as a list of the 50 most powerful women in business. We put Martha on the list for several years. She was building her empire. Then she lied about a stock trade and she got convicted. I went to the trial. I was in touch with her during the trial. I knew her. I had written about her. Um, she got convicted. She got sent down to a prison in West Virginia for five months and then served five months house arrest. And during the time that she was in prison, and by the way, I mean, I think that it was sort of a travesty. I mean, she lied to investigators and she paid really, really big. And I'm just going to fast forward to for a second. Like, the way she handled that gives us all, provides lessons for us all in dealing with adversity because she handled it in the 
most amazing and, and quite frankly, classy way. But anyway, when she was in prison, I, uh, I wanted to do the first story about her after she got out of prison. And I, I ended up sending her magazines every week through her assistant who sent a bag, I think every Friday down to West Virginia. And so I would send over to Julia at Martha Stewart Living on the Media, a packet of the magazines at Time Inc. We used to get them. They'd all be displayed. We could all grab them. People, Time, Sports Illustrated. And I would put together a packet every week and send them down. And Martha really appreciated it. You know, this was before, I mean, this was like 2004. I mean, the internet, people were reading on the internet, but not as much. People were really still like reading physical magazines. So anyway, she got out of prison. Uh, they wouldn't let me see her. Uh, there was a whole army of PR people around her. No, 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 no. She's not doing interviews. And she called me one day and she said, come on Monday morning. I think she called me like on a Saturday and she called me, she said, I'll, I'll talk to you. Let's talk about this story you wanna do. Come Monday morning. And I got a um, dial car, one of those like 777 cars. This was long before Uber. Got a car, went up to Bedford, New York where she lived. And I remember, Right as we were pulling up, I got a call from her PR person, like her head head PR person. Oh my God, what are you doing? Martha just told me she called you and invited you. Oh my God. So Martha did this like totally behind the back of her advisors. And it was great. She was wearing her ankle, ankle brank bracelet and we talked and she said, let's go down to the stable. She said, I only have like, 20 minutes before I, before I violate my leaving this house or whatever. And we jumped in the car and we went down to her stables and she showed me around. And I ended up, I ended up getting the exclusive, like, you know, she, well, we did a cover story where the, the cover line was, it was a quote from her. And the cover line was, I cannot be destroyed. That was the line. Great picture of her and that line in really big print. Oh my gosh, she just hated the cover line. She loved the cover picture, but she hated the cover.